Good day, Tom. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. As you can see, I am rocking my uh, West Highland Terrier shirt because I have a Westie and you have two Westies and we're uh, connected on Facebook. Uh, and so I just wanted to wear this shirt for that purposes. But you and I have never met before. We've never talked before. This is our first exchange. And thank you so much for, again for doing this. Well, I always enjoy seeing your uh, Facebook post, but especially when you post about your Westie. And yeah. uh, as you know, I, I do the same thing from time to time. <laughs> uh, we, we love our Westies, that's for sure. Um, uh, for introducing you to our audience, I've got a four-part um, series of questions here to ask you. And uh, so let's start with... Uh, uh, your name, and where did you grow up? Sure, yeah. My name is uh, Thomas Charles Reeves, although I didn't become a Reeves until 1965 when I was adopted. Uh, I was actually born a Merkel and raised as a Derman, D-E-R-M-A-N. So I've had uh, uh, complexity in my naming. <laughs> but uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., so uh, let's, uh, let's shift gears now into uh, where did you go to college and what did you study? Sure. Well, um, I uh, didn't go to college until after I was in the Army. I got drafted and uh, spent two years in the Army. And in the Army, I was a chaplain's assistant. And part of being trained as a chaplain's assistant is they sent me to a one-week audiovisual training school because you had to show films to soldiers, character guidance films, uh, they were, and uh, gosh, awful films, <laughs> and the soldiers hated them. But uh, <clears throat> in any case, I had to learn to thread a uh, 16 millimeter projector while blindfolded within a certain number of seconds. And the whole school, the audiovisual training school was run on a performance improvement model. It was like a all of the things you had to learn were spread over a thousand points that you earned during that week. And uh, so it was my first introduction to the whole area of instructional design and performance improvement was actually in the Army. I, as a result of my Army experience, I was interested in education. So I got an undergraduate degree at Georgia State University in Atlanta in elementary education or early childhood education, they actually called it and um, became a school teacher. I uh, then, while I was teaching in the uh, Atlanta area, I got interested in a master's degree in library media and took a course in 1973, I think it was, on games and simulation design uh, with uh, Professor Skip Atkinson, who is a dear friend to this day. He just visited, he and his wife just visited us the last month. Um, and um, he had gone to Syracuse University for his PhD. And so he encouraged me to think about uh, graduate school up there. And I, at first, my, my reaction was, I can't go to Syracuse, that's a private school. And, uh, but anyway, I uh, managed to, uh, I only applied to two PhD programs, Florida State and Syracuse. And both accepted me, but Flor uh, Florida State was late on coming forward with money and Syracuse came <laughs> with money right away. And uh, so I went where the money was. <laughs> and uh, so I, anyway, between 1971, when I got out of the army in 1979, uh, April of 79, I got four degrees, an undergraduate degree in uh, early childhood education, a master's degree in library uh, media, uh, another master's degree in instructional technology, and a uh, PhD at Syracuse in what was called the Division of Instructional Design, Development, and Evaluation. And I was in the evaluation track. So my PhD is actually in the evaluation area. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So after you got your PhD, where did you go from there? 
Yes, one of my mentors at Syracuse was Don Ely, and uh, he was uh, one of the pioneers in the field of educational technology. And he had encouraged me to apply for the Fulbright program. He had been a Fulbright scholar in Peru. So I, I applied and, and was very fortunate to go to Peru for uh, a year as a Fulbright lecturer. I literally defended my dissertation on a Friday, got all my corrections made, and then uh, left for Peru on the following Wednesday. <laughs> and uh, those were in the days when you made your corrections on typewriters, by the way. I, had, I hired five women over the weekend to make all the changes <laughs> and everything. Anyway, um, so I, I uh, spent a year in Peru. And then I, my first real job was in the... Uh, Office of Educational Services at the Medical University of South Carolina and uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. I only stayed there 15 months because then I got an opportunity to go to work in Germany for the University of Maryland University College. And I'd never been to Europe, much less lived there. And so that was an exciting opportunity. So I went over there and I worked on an I was director of an interactive video disc training program to teach soldiers how to read technical manuals and um, really enjoyed that year. So I found out uh, over in Heidelberg, I heard about this job at the University of Georgia in the early childhood program. And so I was hired there in uh, fall of 1982 and I cleaned my office out uh, at UGA at, uh, in the fall of 19, I mean, of 2021, just uh, less than a year ago. Uh, initially at Georgia, I was in the early childhood program. Then in 1985, uh, Kent Gustafson and Murray Tillman, two people who were very involved in NSBI and then ISBI, um, they formed a new department, uh, the uh, Department of Instructional Technology. And I was invited to join that department, and I did. We later changed our name to the Department of Learning Design and Technology. And, but I stayed uh, at Georgia for 39 years. So I loved it. Uh, you know, degree programs go through gold periods, I think, you know, when they're really, really strong. I was at Syracuse during that period. We had such wonderful faculty at Syracuse. And then I was very fortunate to be at Georgia during, uh, I think, its strongest period as well. So now you're a professor emeritus from Georgia. And I, I was looking at your bio and you'd spent 39 years and, and 10 months. You just couldn't do that last two months I <laughs> uh, to make it an even 40. But uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'd like to shift gears here. The, the title of my video series here is HPT Videos, Human Performance Technology, uh, Many Means to the Ends of Performance and, and Instruction, Training, Learning is, is one part of that. But can you talk to us a little bit about what you call that and when did you first get exposed to that? Yeah, um, well, I... Um... I guess my first exposure was uh, while I was at Syracuse. There were two professors at Syracuse, Phil Doty and Alex Romazowski, who really rep represented um, that focus within the larger field of say educational technology. The department at that time, when I first started, was called the Area of Instructional Technology. And as I mentioned, it later changed its name to uh, Instructional Design Development and Evaluation. But uh, Phil and uh, Rami, as he's known, uh, really were uh, the folks within the program. We had other excellent faculty. I mentioned Don Ely, Dick Clark, uh, Charlie Rigaluth, um, and uh, Bob Diamond, who was uh, started the first instructional development center at a university and so forth. Uh, but uh, Phil and Rami uh, were very big into the performance engineering and organizational development paradigms. They actually wrote a chapter 
one time called the organizational and performance engineering paradigms and their relationships to instructional systems development. So there was that contrast between ISD on one hand and then performance uh, you know, improvement and so forth on the other hand. Um, for me, I really like the word performance. And, and uh, in fact, when I was a co-founder of a laboratory at UGA called the Learning and Performance Support Laboratory, LPSL. And uh, it really took off. We started that around in the early 90s. We were able to hire uh, Michael Hannafin to direct it. I got a grant to bring him in as an endowed chair. And um, he did a phenomenal job. At one point, we had six full-time PhD researchers in the LPSL, 100% research people. And we also had about 35 PhD students that we were supporting at the same time. So the lab really took off. Uh, sadly, uh, uh, it's no longer in existence. That's a whole other story. But really have always thought that uh, instruction and training uh, are terms that are important, but it's really performance, learning and performance that are our ultimate goals, and they need to be put uh, in the forefront. Yes, thank you. For our audience, can you share with us some of your most early influences I'm thinking people, books, and articles so that uh, the audience may want to follow up with them. Yeah, well, I, I certainly think of Bob Mager, for example. Uh, I remember um, hearing him speak uh, while I was in graduate school, uh, and probably at an NSPI meeting. Uh, at that time, it was still an NSPI. Um, and... Uh, he may have come to Syracuse. They had a whole series of people coming into Syracuse as uh, guest lecturers. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, Ramazowski and Doty, uh, who had that orientation within the program. Um, and then when I went to Georgia, uh, Murray Tillman was very active in that whole area. Uh, he and Kent Gustafson wrote some textbooks on uh, instructional design, instructional systems design, but Murray was always more of the performance oriented person and got, uh, I remember he had um, the local chapter of NSBI come up and hold their meeting in Athens one time. And I started getting involved in it then and uh, joined the NSBI and, and had some great experiences over the years there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Let me shift gears slightly here. Uh, it, uh, this is, again, a, a, as a way to provide an example to our audience. But so this is about elevator speeches. And if you were to give a 30-second elevator speech, perhaps you're asked at a garden party or something, you know, Tom, what do you do? How, how did you uh, share with others what it is that you did for a living? Yeah, well, um... I've, as I mentioned, my uh, primary degree was in the evaluation area. So I am I'm very interested in research, particularly uh, design-based research or educational design research. So I would say, um, you know, I, I really work in the area of trying to improve people's learning and their performance um, through uh, in, uh using uh, instructional systems design, but also very big emphasis on evaluation and research, that that is really the driving force. And, and in particular within the research paradigm, there are those who, and I think there's, this is still pretty prevalent in the uh, ISBI world, who really look toward experimental research, uh, uh, randomized controlled trials are the the holy grail, I guess, but I'm more on the end of uh, looking at uh, design-based research. So the difference is that uh, traditional research methods look and try to see, uh, did this thing work better than that thing? 
<laughs> so anytime a new technology comes out like VR, there's going to be a number of studies that look at, you know, can virtual reality uh, do a better job of training in X field than say traditional training or, or whatever. Whereas in the design-based research, we ask, um, what's the problem and how can we use learning principles, learning theory, and perhaps technology to make this thing work or make this thing better, improve performance, improve learning, improve motivation, uh, improve commitment, uh, those types of things. So it's really a very different orientation to traditional research methods. So I've been pushing that, written a couple books on that, uh, and uh, really um, promote that whole area. Yes, well, I'm going to include in our show notes here on the YouTube video, uh, various URLs for our audience so they can follow up to your website and, and take a look at some of your, uh, your uh, books and other references. Um, as a lifelong learner, uh, do you have a current focus uh, that you're uh, centered on and are you doing any writing about that right now? Yes, uh, absolutely. I love to write and I continue to write <laughs> and publish. And uh, I um, recently uh, published an article um, in, um, trying to remember the name of the journal now, <laughs> um, the, uh, this is really embarrassing. Can't even remember the name of my own article. Um, the, um, Hold on a second. I've got to look at my CV. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I've been working with a former doctoral student. I served on a committee at the University of Minnesota on the whole area of active learning design. And she, uh, in her dissertation, used design-based research. So we just had an article published in May of 2022 in Active Learning in Higher Education. And that article we published in an open access format. It was very expensive to do that. But we think that uh, the article is called Refining Active Learning Design Principles Through Design-Based Research. And it's an attempt to actually measure the, the degree to which active learning design principles are designed into online learning. Of course, online learning is more important than ever given the pandemic and uh, other developments. And so um, uh, continuing to work on that, she and I are working on a second article right now that we uh, are, uh, goes further in uh, exploring this whole idea of how can you uh, instantiate active learning design into an online or hybrid learning environment. I'm also working on some additional uh, 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 an article on uh, new research methodologies, uh, and uh, with a couple of, of colleagues at other universities. Um, it was interesting. I, I mentioned virtual reality earlier, and uh, I hope this isn't too much of a tangent, but uh, I noticed that um, ISPI is having a, a session coming up on virtual reality, and um, it's called How VR Will Disrupt Education and Training for the Skilled Trades. And this is going to be in July of 2022. It's a, a webinar. And, uh, but it's interesting. The, uh, um, basically, the person who's presenting is um, saying that uh, VR is going to revolutionize education. And in one of the articles I uh, just uh, drafted, I quoted a paper from 1992 that was called uh, Virtual Reality in Education. You know, this is 30 years ago, okay? So in the article, uh, it says, uh, the majority of widespread end user applications will not be available before 18 months and maybe as long as five years from now. And, uh, but they had in this article from 1992, the author predicted that the 
uh, there would be a virtual reality curriculum that would take over education and training. And uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know. Have you noticed VR has taken over the curriculum? I don't, don't think I, so. You know, th this just reminded me of Thomas Edison uh, talking about how uh, uh, movies were going were gonna to revolutionize uh, education back in the uh, early 1900s. But I think we have, uh, Joe Harless said it well, I think well, there's a lot of fondling going on with of technology and hardware. Um, we seem to be enamored with it. And, and of course, I think it truly has had an impact in how we do our work, how we administrate our work, how we deploy our work. But we can get too often distracted by the uh, the, the next shiny object. And perhaps, I mean, I'm sure there are use applications, but I recall uh, Dick Clark, Richard E. Clark, uh, sharing with me one time about, you know, the, some of these things work, but it's tremendous cost and there's cheaper ways of doing it and accomplishing the same results so if you're cost conscious you know I, I i think that needs to be looked at but i think it's worthy to for people and organizations to experiment and do a little research in these uh, uh technologies that are here with us already and as the future brings new ones in um i think we have to be open to all of that but but yeah, there's. I think there's a there's you know quite a bit of that. But you certainly are keeping busy. It's not just uh, your two Westies button and zipper that are keeping you busy. Um, um, so yeah, there's no it, such thing as retirement for you, I guess. No, I've. Uh, my wife says I'm failing to retire big time. <laughs> but uh, and I continue to do other things. Uh, I continue to. Uh, uh, for right now, for example, I'm reviewing somebody's tenure promotion. Uh, package for a, a major university. Uh, I continue to serve on doctoral committees uh, at a distance, usually in places like Australia and South Africa. Um, during my uh, career, I got to spend a lot of time in Australia and uh, ended up writing a couple books with Australians. One is an evaluation textbook, another one is on um, uh, authentic learning within the context of online learning or e-learning. And um, so I've probably traveled to Australia 14 times and stayed there as long as five months at a time and just love it and have so many dear friends down there. One of the biggest regrets right now is the difficulty in traveling uh, and would love to return to Australia. We were last there in 2017 and Trisha and I both would love to go back. My wife, by the way, Trisha Reeves, is a, a professor emerita of social work from uh, the University of Georgia. So um, we both got the emeritus status when we uh, retired, which was very gratifying. Well, let me switch uh, gears here a little bit to terminology, the language that we use. People at NSPI, at the Joe Harless in particular, used to complain about this endlessly. Uh, rightfully so, I think. But so my question is, is there a performance improvement or learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you just want to put your spin on it. Do you have anything for us? You know, I thought about that and, and I actually went, <laughs> um, I tried to find the ISPI used to have a glossary of terms and I could not find that online. I don't know if they still maintain that or not. Uh, the Wikipedia entry <clears throat> for human performance technology has a link to it, but the link is dead. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of my frustrations with so much on it's online dead links. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But that's a whole other story. But um, I, I guess the term motivation, I don't think gets as much attention in this field or this area as um, perhaps it should. And the, particularly with motivation, I like the term conation or the cognitive domain. Uh, in uh, our field, we often emphasize the cognitive domain. And in fact, if you type cognitive, C-O-N-A-T-I-V-E, into a Word document, it tries to correct it to cognitive. <laughs> but there, the co cognitive domain has been around for thousands of years. Aristotle talked about it. But 
the cognitive, the affective, and the um, cognitive are very important. It's the difference between knowing, feeling, and doing. And we underemphasize that follow through, that drive, that commitment to good work, I think sometimes. Uh, for example, I, I mentioned I, I worked in the medical University of South Carolina, I've continued to do a lot of work in, in medical education and uh, public health education, traveled for years with the World Health Organization doing workshops and so forth. And um, in the, for example, uh, cleaning your hands at a hospital, we know that thousands and thousands of people get sick in hospitals simply because medical personnel, primarily physicians, don't disinfect their hands when they go from patient to patient and uh, people die as a result. There have been studies done that have shown that when they ask physicians, how often do you disinfect your hands when you go from patient to patient, they say, oh, more than 90% compliance. But then they have studies where they have nurses actually track the doctors and it's down in the 20s uh, percent. And so we know these doctors have the cognitive knowledge about the need to disinfect their hands. And they probably have the feeling, the passion, the affective feeling that they want to do it, but they just don't do it. It's too much of a bother. And, we, and you think of any area of human performance, you're going to find that difference between knowing, feeling, and doing. And we don't emphasize enough the doing the cognitive domain, the follow through. Uh, and so I guess that's one area that I would try to heighten within the overall field. Thank you very much for that. Earlier, we talked about some of your earliest influences in the business, but are there people or books or articles that you might point people to that are more recent and have had a recent impact on your practices? Um, well, um, I was active in uh, the field of instructional systems design, and then it became learning and performance and so forth. And I keep up with the literature, and there are a lot of young scholars out there now doing good work. Uh, George Valencianos, uh, who's in Canada as someone, Dave Wiley, uh, who uh, was at BYU. He, I think he still has some kind of connection with BYU, but now he works for Lumen Learning. Um, those folks uh, I look to a lot. Uh, my co-author, Susan McKinney at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, where we've written two editions of our Conducting Educational Design Research book, have a lot of uh, um, basically admiration and uh, to her commitment and the, the group at the University of Twente uh, been able to visit there a number of times and they do excellent work. Um, and then there are people uh, in the field that uh, I don't always agree with, uh, but I certainly respect them. Uh, Paul Kirshner at uh, also uh, in the Netherlands, um, uh, of course, you mentioned Dick Clark. I, I still, I learned so much from him. I had five courses with him at Georgia, and, uh, excuse me, at Syracuse. And uh, uh, he gave me uh, just a healthy skepticism that anytime somebody comes in and says, we've got the solution to the problem, you know, it's LaserDisc, you know, it's CDI, it's virtual reality. <laughs> it's, uh, to have a healthy skepticism about that and to want to see the evidence. Uh, and uh, not just some little, you know, statistically significant difference, but a real difference in terms of people's lives, how people learn, how people perform. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm probably... <laughs> I should have anticipated this question more, but uh, there are other people I, uh, I keep up with the literature and uh, um, I uh, just 
recently uh, decided that I can't maintain all these subscriptions to all these different areas. Uh, um, I really like AERA, American Educational Research Association, because I joined it, I think, in 1975. And a few years ago, they said, OK, you've been a member so long, you don't have to pay for membership anymore. I wish some other associations would do that. I'm 75 and, and uh, you know, uh, I have to justify these uh, additional expenses. But anyway, um, there are a lot of folks who impact me because I do try to keep up with the literature. Well, thank you. And I think that would be uh, good for everybody if we could only all afford it. That's the, that's the huge issue. Tom, thanks so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me. I, my final question to you is something for the younger people, people newer to the field, not necessarily younger, but people new to the field of learning and or performance improvement. But what advice would you give them to a new person coming in? Yeah, well, one of the things I'd advise, I was looking at the uh, certificate program at Florida State on humans performance, human performance technology. And I was glad to see that they include a course in evaluation. I would advise young folks to get skilled in evaluation. There are lots of different evaluation methods. The Association, uh, uh, American Evaluation Association, AEA, as a group that I've belonged to, to for many years. You can learn a lot from them and from their publications and webinars and so forth. So get skilled in evaluation. It's a meta skill that has uh, application in many different areas. And I'm still surprised to see that a number of master's degree programs in uh, instructional design and development don't require an evaluation course. I, to me, that's just essential. So get skilled in evaluation is something I really advise. Thank you for that. I, I, I agree. It's so, I think that that's so important. If we can't evaluate what we do, how do we know if we're doing well or not and, and where we might improve? Uh, so part of continuous improvement of our own practices uh, requires that, that you evaluate your work. Uh, yeah. Tom, thank you, know, you so much again, and uh, um, I'll, I'll let you go, but I want, I want to uh, thank you for everything that you've done, all your contributions to the field. Um, again, thanks so much, and have a great day. Thank you, Guy. Really appreciate it.